What's happening, Sun Valley? Kevin here, excited to be with you guys today. I don't know about you, but sometimes I build things up a little bit too big in my mind. I come up with these grandiose plans and I think everything's going to work out perfectly. It's the optimist inside of me. And one of those scenarios is with my sons. I come up with these grand schemes and I think everything's just gonna go smooth. But if you have ever had young kids, you know that that's not always the case. And one of those scenarios that has played out time and time again in my life as a dad is when I take my boys fishing. And if you have young kids and you've actually tried to take them fishing, you probably know where I'm going with this. Usually what happens is I get all the lines set up and toss the poles in for the boys and make sure they're all baited well and they got their little bobbers on there and all sorts of things. And then I have about 30 seconds of peace where I'm starting to maybe bait my own hook. And then all of a sudden it's, Dad, um, I need you to cast again. What? I just casted. And then I throw the line out and then the next kid comes up to me, Dad, I need you to cast for me too. Oh, and my bait fell off. So then I bait their hook and cast the line back in and then the next one's barking at me. Dad, I need you to bait mine again too. My bait's gone. And so I bait his again and I throw it out there again and the next one's back and he goes, Dad, my line's stuck and I can't get it unstuck. Oh, and then I unstick their line and, and then the next kid's like, Dad, um, something happened and now I have this huge tangle of all sorts of things and I look and the guy has like a ginormous yarn ball of fish in line and lures that don't even belong to us and somehow and in some way in 30 seconds when I wasn't paying attention he took a perfectly straight line with one hook and a couple of sinkers and a bobber and made it into some crazy abstract masterpiece that belongs in some museum somewhere and I have to sit there for the next three hours rebaiting hooks and, and unsticking lines and trying to untangle this cobweb of a mess and that is a fishing trip for a dad with two young kids and inevitably what happens with me is I've got dad I need this and dad I need that and dad can you help me and dad can you unstick this and dad can you untangle this in my ear over and over and over again and eventually I lose my cool and I get frustrated and I go ah and I tell you that story because that's not God That's not the father that we have in heaven. See, we have a patient God. We have a forgiving God. We have a God who does not pour out condemnation upon us, but extends grace and extends mercy. He's happy to extend a second chance. He's happy to, to wade into our mess and untangle it, the thing that we've created. We're going to look at a really well-known piece of scripture this morning together, or this afternoon together, or this evening together, depending on when you're watching this. John 3, 16 is one of the most well-known verses throughout scripture. But I want to include another verse with it because it helps us understand the reason that Jesus came to this earth and the plan that God had to redeem us from the beginning of creation. John 3, 16 and 17 says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. See, fact is, is God put all things together, you and I included. He built those things. We see it in Genesis. He made all things. He spoke them into existence. And when he looked upon all the things that he made, he liked them. In Genesis 1.31, he says that they are good. And see, I don't think we have an accurate understanding of the word good in our culture today. I feel like good is what we attach to things that are passable or things that are subpar. It's like I go to Del Taco because it's three for a dollar forty nine or whatever the price tag is nowadays. And someone asks me, hey, how were those tacos? They were good. See what I'm saying? We look at scripture and we see that God looks at everything that he made and, and he says it's good. And we think, oh, does that mean that he thinks it's subpar? No. He's excited about what he made. He looks at it and he goes, that's fantastic. That's amazing. Yay me. We did it. 
right? He's excited about all the things that are creeping along the ground and all the things that are flying in the air. He's excited about the land. He's excited about the water. And he's excited about us that are made in his own image. And he gives us dominion over all those things that crawl on the ground and fly in the air. He says it's good in a way that you and I don't associate with the word. And I want to take a look at some things about God that we see in creation and we see in John 3, 16 and 17. First, he created it and we messed it up. We are the kids in the father's fishing story. We're the one that keep losing our bait. We're the one that keeps getting it snagged in a tree. We're the one that hands our dad this big old twisted ball of yarn with a whole bunch of mess in it and says, can you please untangle this for me? See, he created it. He set it up in perfection and we messed it up. But there's two amazing things about God that I don't want us to miss in this scenario. See, he's not the imperfect dad like me that loses his cool and gets frustrated and yells and, and, and lashes out and is disappointed because we didn't meet expectation. No, no, no. He's the perfect dad that does not condemn us. And this is not new to John 3, 17. This exists way back in Genesis chapter 3. When Adam had eaten of the fruit and he's ashamed and he's embarrassed and he's hiding and eating, God doesn't just come and go, Adam, I see you in the bushes. Shame for what you've done. No, he wades into the garden and he says, Adam, where are you? Where are you hiding? And don't think for a second that God doesn't know where Adam is. But what he's doing is he's entering into the garden as a humble, as a merciful, as a gracious father, not rubbing his son's nose in his mistakes, but approaching him with humility, asking for his son to wade back into his mess with him. His dad is approachable. The God that we serve is approachable. He's loving. He's gracious to us, even though we messed it up. The other thing I want us to understand about God is that, yes, he doesn't condemn us. And he also wasn't surprised. He wasn't surprised when sin entered the world in Genesis chapter 3. And he's not surprised about our mess. In the same way that he approaches Adam with grace, he's not surprised by our sins. My friends, God loves the real you. And the second thing I want us to see in John 3, 16 and 17 is that not only does he love the real you and not only does he love the real I, but he proves that love. Look, he paid a price in advance for the real you to offer you real peace while you were still his enemy. While sin was still the ruler and authority in your life, he paid a price so that he could pull you from the life that you and I had made for ourselves. And the third thing that I want us to see is that he restores us. If you know Jesus, you don't need to try and belong. You already do. He extends a free gift of grace to you and to I. And when we accept it, we not only get this new life founded in Jesus, but we get added into his family as adopted sons and daughters. We don't need to put on some, some persona that isn't us. No, no, no. We don't need to try and belong or earn his favor. We already belong. He loves us. He calls us son. He calls us daughter. And we get to call him father because of the work that Jesus has done on our behalf before we even knew that we needed it. And if you don't know Jesus, know this. He is for you, and he came to save you. He didn't come to condemn you. He came to pull you out of the mess that you have made this life and offer you a better one. My friends, to know Jesus is to know peace. Let me pray with us. In Jesus' name. And I come before you today, I just thank you so much for, for the life that we have in you, to be found in you. We lay down this life surrendered to you, Lord, knowing that you offer grace and mercy that is far greater than we could ever earn, than we definitely deserve, Lord. And so I thank you for that. I thank you that you came to save, that you came to redeem, and that you, that you came so that we could be called son and daughter. Thank you for that gift, Lord Jesus. May we walk in accordance with your will for our life, Lord. May we look to you as the answer of all things, as the perfecter of all things, as the creator of all things. So thank you for today, Lord. It's a gift. May it be lived for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, friends. We'll see you next time.